So good morning, everybody. I did something that I wasn't really sure if I'm allowed to do this, but I changed my title. I was supposed to talk about surface waves, but since this um, summer school is about the deep history of Earth and a deep Earth in general, I thought it might be really cool to put more of um, the normal mode of free oscillations into my talk. And um, you know, especially since free oscillation research is always considered a little bit like the nerd sciences of geophysics. I want, I want to show you that you know, it's actually really important to look at free oscillations, and free oscillations are related to body waves and surface waves, and you can do really cool stuff with it. The other thing is I'm supposed to uh, introduce you to the tutorial this afternoon, and so the tutorial is about the inversion of um, surface wave data to dispersion maps, for dispersion maps, and it's very closely related to the talk. So this talk is an open-ended talk, and somebody has to stop me after an hour or so. All right, let's get started. Uh, this is, you know, very simple. So it's very simple start, and then gets complicated really quickly. Um, to put us on the same page, we have uh, body waves and surface waves. The body waves are the compressional waves, the ones that arrive first at a seismic station, uh, P waves, and then shear waves, the S waves. Um, we have the conceptual image here, and then also a travel time plot as a function of distance, where you see the, the body waves, the P waves, and the S waves, <clears throat> they arrive first. All right, and then we have the surface waves. There are two types. Uh, in principle, the love waves that are um, a superposition of the horizontally polarized shear waves, the SH waves, uh, love waves, they are a little bit faster typically than the Rayleigh waves. Rayleigh waves are these complicated, uh, a rather complicated mix or superposition of um, SV waves and the um, P waves that are uh, reflected and refracted uh, within the shallow layers here and they travel along the surface, and they are typically the slowest here, the Rayleigh waves. All right. Now later we'll learn that um, we have fundamental modes, so the Rayleigh waves are actually the fundamental mode surface waves, the same with the love waves, and then we have these overtones um, that are more and more superpositions of deeper reaching body waves, and um, they are actually also traveling faster as a consequence. All right, so really quickly. A different part of waves. Uh, the Rayleigh waves um, in textbooks, they are um, very often likened to the surface waves that you see on water. Um, with a few exceptions, um, Rayleigh waves particle motion is typically elliptical, and un um, unlike the, um, in the particle motion in water um, that have a circular motion, in both cases you have uh, exponential decay in a particle motion, um, the difference between the Rayleigh waves and, uh, and a water surface waves, though, is that Rayleigh waves, they are retrograde. So that means in the direction of uh, propagation, the, um, the particle motion um, goes um, the, other, the other direction, unlike the ocean surface waves or, or the water surface waves. One thing that I wanted to point out, though, is that these waves, they... Um, uh, a means of energy transport, but not mass transport. So you know, everybody probably knows that you know a tsunami doesn't really transport things. So it's actually the ocean currents subsequently that bring all the debris from the Japan earthquake to the uh, west coast in North America um, by now. All right. So energy transport. Um, I guess you should never give a seismology talk without showing a seismogram. So here's a typical three-component um, seismogram from an older um, um, earthquake, relatively large, a magnitude surface, uh, surface wave magnitude 6.8, um, already rotated. So typically, we have a three-component seismometer that measures the motion in a vertical direction and in a north-south direction and east-west. Then we know what, where the earthquake came from, and then we rotate the two horizontal components um, into the radial direction, so the direction um, where the waves ca came from, the direction to the earthquake, radial, and then a transverse, which is uh, perpendicular to it. And so on this type of three-component seismogram, we see the body waves coming in first, so P wave and then the shear wave, 
and then um, the uh, love wave first, the first love wave train, Rayleigh wave train on a vertical and the radial component. Typically, the love wave only on a transverse component. And then I'll talk about these waves later. These are the so-called major arc uh, surface wave trains that go the other way around, the, the long way. We'll get, to it, get back to that in a second. All right, so here it is. So the, these numbers here, these are the wave orbit numbers for Rayleigh waves and, and love waves. So you have R1, the minor arc, um, which is the shortest distance, and then those even wave, um, wave orbit numbers are uh, the long way. And then, of course, with large earthquakes, um, the, the surface waves travel um, repeatedly around the globe, and so that's why you have these successive numbers here. So R1, and then one time around the globe, one more is R3, and then R5, and R7, and then a long way is R2, uh, 4, and 6, and so on. In terms of surface waves, so this is only a vertical component here now. In terms of surface waves, um, so R1, R2 in these things, these are the, the fundamental modes. And then sometimes, since we are only interested in the fundamental modes, all this other thing is sometimes called the X phase. So these are the overtones or, you know, all the other, the superposition of the, the body waves. And I'll get back to this in a moment. Um, if we, of course, we have a global seismic network, so we can, um, if we plot all the seismic stations that we have in this nice record section, so as a function of time and epicentral distance now, we, we see this really nice um, progression of, first of all, the Rayleigh wave or the surface wave here until you get to the antipode of the earthquake, 180 degrees, and then you see that R1 and R2 are joining as far as the travel time is concerned, and I'll get back to this later. This is a so-called caustic, where these waves come together. Um, and then the long way, um, you get R2, and then R3, and so on. And the things, in, in principle, if you turn it around, it's simply a travel time plot, really. And you have the, the body waves here, P wave arriving first, and then the S wave here in between. And then, of course, just like the fundamental modes are doing, the overtones also um, you know, bounce off repeatedly um, on the surface, so you get these um, body waves traveling the long way. All right. Um, okay, so here is the first um, connection to modes. So all these, the surface waves and the body waves, you can um, you can think of them as when they uh, super superimpose. Then you get standing waves on a, on a lim on the finite body. Then you get standing waves, which gives you the normal modes. And we distinguish between actually radial modes. We'll talk about this later. But in principle, we have toroidal modes, which are the shearing motion and the spheroidal modes. And the toroidal modes, so this is an omega. It's, it's a wave number frequency plot. So in principle, these are dispersion diagrams, and I get back to this later. For now, I only want to um, point out that, you know, first of all, the, love, the, the toroidal mode plots, they are pretty simple. And, and what you see here are different isolated mode branches. So this is frequency um, wave number. This here is a fundamental mode. Um, and then you get the overtone. So this is the first overtone. Um, second overtone, and so on, and so on, to higher um, overtone number. Um, for spheroidal modes, the plot looks a lot more complicated. Um, you still have the fundamental mode. The Rayleigh wave is pretty isolated here and looks pretty simple. But as, as soon as you get to the first overtone or so, you see that some of these mode branches, they even overlap. Some of the modes you can actually not observe. So it's, it's especially these two that go straight up here. These are so-called Stonelian modes. So these are modes that travel along the interface. In particular here, the inner core boundary is this one. And uh, the core mantle boundary is the other one. Um, so in principle, we cannot really observe these because the, the motion uh, decays exponentially away from those interfaces. And there's only a small chance to uh, observe 
um, particular ones along this branch if they couple with other modes. And then you get some energy um, transference into the modes that we can observe, so the 1S branch, for example. But otherwise, we can't really um, observe these. Um, this here is just a summary, again, of this plot here. Um, we use, depending on a frequency and a mode branch, and I don't want to get into too much detail here, but de depending um, on a mode branch, there are different techniques how we can observe these modes and measure the frequencies. Of course, the different frequencies, by measuring the frequencies, you, you make inferences about a structure simply by um, measuring the, the average or the fiducial frequency, you can um, do um, 1D modeling, so 1D Earth structure, um, but then 3D Earth structure um, removes this degeneracy, and I'll get back to this in a second. So anyway, we use different techniques to measure all these modes. Um, here is um, how these modes see the structure inside the Earth. So in principle, what we do when we are, um, observe modes is that we um, solve an eigenvalue problem. And here are the eigenfunctions. And unfortunately, I didn't bring the formula, but I wanted to keep it simple. So in principle, these things here, these 1D plots, they tell you how the individual modes are sensitive to structure inside the Earth. So this is for toroidal modes, fundamental toroidal modes. And so in principle, you see here by the energy density that the fundamental uh, toroidal modes are only sensitive to mantle structure here, mantle shear. And actually, even the overtones, they only see mantle shear, um, shear velocity. There are some modes that are sensitive to inner core shear, but then again, there is no connection to the surface, so we can't really um, observe these. Yes? Um, some of this is actually explained in one of my later slides. Okay, and maybe then it becomes clear. If it's still not clear then, then please ask again. But in principle, toroidal modes are a superposition of SH waves. And a superposition of all the other waves, the P and, and the SV, that would be spheroidal modes. Standing... That, that, there's a traveling and standing wave analogy. But I'll have a plot, and that, that might actually explain it a little better. OK. So for the um, spheroidal modes, things are a little more complicated. Uh, actually, first of all, we distinguish now the, ra the radial modes. They have motion only in a, in a vertical direction. And they are uh, named as NS0. And the N is actually typifying um, the number of nodes in, in a vertical direction. So zero, S0, zero, for example, is that breathing mode that goes out, in and out, in and out. Um, and then um, with successive nodes in, with depth here, you increase that, that N here. The, so in this case, we have six S0. Uh, fundamental spheroidal modes, they have no node here at least in, a, in a energy density plots. Again, these fundamental modes, they are only sensitive to mantle structure here. And then you have overtone modes, and they can actually reach into the core here. So I should say here, this white thing here, and this is normalized radius. So on the top, you have the mantle. Then this gray thing is the outer core. And then this white thing in underneath is the inner core here. So some of the... Uh, overtones, they reach into the outer core. Now we have to worry about, uh, in the energy density, we have to worry about compressional energy density as well as shear energy density here. Of course, in the outer core, this is always zero. And then we have these, uh, these um, the set of modes that actually have sensitivity in the inner core as well here. So you see here even some of the modes, they even have um, sensitivity to shear and um, shear velocity in the in a core here, 13 is one, for example. All right? 
Y yes, they are also sensitive to density, and I, I get to this in a few slides. This is actually very important, thank you. So it's not only, right, it's not only the elastic velocities and actually also attenuation. They are also, that's the nice thing about free oscillation, the nice thing about modes. They, they are also sensitive to density, and it's one of the few um, easy ways in seismology to get, um, to get a grab at density inside the Earth. I'll get back to this in a sec. Um, this here now shows a spectrum um, relatively early in the time series. You see, so this, is, this starts at the time of the earthquake, um, about 50 hours long. And you see in a typical spectrum here, um, you see mostly the fundamental modes. So here these orange lines, these are fundamental modes. And you see that you know, these peaks, they align really nicely with a the theoretical uh, fundamental mode frequencies. But if you now start later in a time series, if you start successively later in a time series, the overtones, they um, get are more and more dominant. I actually forgot to say that um, it actually turns out attenuation in the outer core is, is um, very small. And so the overtones, um, they ring for a much longer time than the fundamental modes do. So yes, just a sec. So um, since the overtones then are more sensitive to the, the low attenuating part, if you start later in a time series in terms of spectral analysis, then they will dominate the spectrum. And that's what you see um, in this slide. Yeah? Okay. In this slide, the y-axis to me, I'm thinking, is the amount of energy in the system. Yeah. And in the yeah. previous slide, the x-axis, I'm still trying to figure out. Yes, <laughs> you're right. So in this, in this case, this is depth, and, in, and this is energy, that is essentially. Energy also. Yes. Okay. For a particular right. mode, this. Okay, so. I'm trying to use those numbers, which are very significant when you hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Can we turn the microphone off for a second? Can we turn that movie off for a sec? <laughs> Yes, was that not clear? I'm really sorry. But so these are essentially, if you sum up all the modes and you want, no, if, if you sum up the Earth structure, you integrate over Earth structure to get a mode frequency, you have to integrate over a kernel, which is the sensitivity kernel. And this is basically for each mode, this is a sensitivity kernel. I guess I should have really put up the math here. But this is depth here, and this is the amount of sensitivity to VP or VS in principle that this particular mode has. Is, is that clear now? I'm really sorry. Huh? This here? Um, This is, yeah, sorry, I totally forgot about this. Yes, this is the frequency. This is not the amount of, and these things are normalized. <laughs> yes, so these are two radial modes. Zero is zero is a radial mode. Six is zero is a radial mode. Um, zero is zero has a frequency of, yes, I should say this. So zero is zero is, has a frequency of 0.81 millihertz. So this is in millihertz. And so this is, 6S0 has a frequency of 5.7 millihertz. Okay, one further question. In your seismogram, how do you know that which peak is the normal mode? How do you know that what measure was given from the measure of the I was just getting back to that, yes. What is a spectrum? Okay. All right, do we, have any, do we have any more confusion about this slide here before I go on? Yeah. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> so these are, this here is an individual mode, different types of modes, radial modes, fundamental modes, so the zero S branch, and then overtones. And these are the frequencies, and these are the sensitivities. So basically, how I have to 
integrate earth structure to get the frequency for this particular mode. Yeah? Come again, please. Yeah. Um, I guess the long answer is it's just a different way to plot the sensitiv sensitivity. I mean, in terms of math, what you really, what you really, maybe you can help me out. <laughs> what you, um, what you really integrate over are the eigenfunctions. If you if you pose it as an eigenvalue problem, you you have the eigenfunctions that you integrate over. But if you want to think it in terms of the elastic parameters or the velocities, then then um, it's easier to cast this in terms. Of, in principle, this is just a different way to show the sensitivities. But when we actually want to solve for the frequencies, we use the eigenfunctions. Right. Right. I thought that's yeah, that's about the way I said said it, I guess. With my accent, I guess. Yeah? Hmm? The average to Earth, yes. The average Earth. So one one D model. The average to Earth. This here? Well, it is it is tiny, but it is not, not but it is non-zero. So these modes, unlike the the actual true inner core modes, these ones you can actually observe because these things here are not they are non-zero at the surface. So you actually have a chance to observe these at the surface. It is small. It is really small. But you, but if you have deep earthquakes. Then, you, then these modes are actually excited, and then you can actually see them. But, but you need a deep excitation here, I guess. That's, that's the point. OK, so the next plot, the x-axis and the, the y-axis are totally different. We look at spectra. So, so what we do is we take a time series, and then in principle, there's more to it, but in principle, we do a Fourier transform of that thing, right? And, and so think of the Earth like a bell or like a guitar. Any finite body has certain resonance frequencies. And so what you see then, if you, if you take this Fourier transform, and then as a function of frequency, you only get certain lines, the resonance lines of the Earth. Is that, is that how I should have? Okay. All right. 
So how do I know which of that peak is a mode and which one isn't? Well, yes, some of these peaks are noise. And so that's why it's important to not only look at one particular station and calculate one particular spectrum, but we have the whole global seismic network. That, and so you look at um, the spectra at other stations too, and then they have these um, certain um, resonance of peaks in common, and then you can distinguish what is noise and what is not. All right? Okay, so I also said to get back to this, if you start, if you, if you take your Fourier transform right after the earthquake, then you see that your spectrum is going to be dominated by those fundamental modes. Now, the fundamental modes, they only sense essentially the uppermost layers, which are actually compared to the rest of the planet, highly attenuating. So if you start later in a time series, then those modes that look deeper inside the Earth, especially in the outer core, where the attenuation is really low, then they will dominate your spectrum. And that's what you see here. So it turns out that the, the very low L, so if you have a NSL um, mode that, that have sensitivity to the very deep Earth, they will dominate in a spectrum. The radial modes will dominate. So here, it, um, near the 0s5, we actually have the 0s0, that breathing mode. And this is actually dominating the spectrum. Then we have here some overtones between 0s5 and 0s6. There's actually a pair. It's 3s1 and 1s3, um, very um, low attenuation. And then we have some of these here. These are actually the modes that are sensitive to the inner core. And so, how, how yes, I, I, uh, I wanted to get to this just in a sec. So here, OK. Is what you call noise what you would get if you do the identical process in non-earthquake time? Or is it? Um, okay, it could be harmonics that are generated at the site. So sometimes the recording system, if, if your digitizer, your electronics is wrong, it actually can cause harmonics that look very much like um, free oscillations. So it's the, it's the sensor itself that can cause peaks. And we had that in, in one of my experiments, we had one that, that set right on top of a mode. And if you don't have different instruments or you don't stack. So the point here is, since we have many stations, and then we can start stacking um, all the spectra under certain rules. And then you can distinguish. First of all, you can find out which mode you are dealing with. So if I actually run this movie here, you see we started spectrum at the beginning and then we start successively later and you see very nicely how the fundamental modes actually fade really quickly because they are only sensitive to the highly attenuating shallow mantle. And then you see how the high Q or the low attenuating modes then um, prevail. Now, okay, so here for example, we still have these modes that, that you know, here it says zero is 20, but it actually turns out this is not really zero is 20 anymore. It's actually one of those modes that are highly sensitive to the core and is actually, in this case, even to the inner core. And it's actually eight as one. Now, from this one spectrum, we don't know which mode we are dealing with. But, you know, experience will tell you it cannot be the zero is 20 at this point because at that point when you start so late in a spectrum, the zero is 20 is already attenuated away. The other thing is if you start stacking um, spectra of all the stations that we have around the globe, then you will see that they are, these spectra are not in phase to add up to zero is 20, but they are in phase to add up to eight is one. So that's how we know that we are dealing with ADIS-1. So it's actually really important that you have many seismometers distributed around the globe, because with one seismometer alone, you can't really, you can't really decide which mode you're dealing with. So that's actually really important. 
All right? Yeah. I have a question about the names of the modes. So the number after the letter, <laughs> is that yeah. the number of nodal points in the vertex direction? So in principle, it is that actually is only true for the radial modes and the toroidal modes. So the number in front of the letter tells you the number of nodes with depth. All right? And in principle, the, the, the number here after the letter is, is the, um, the wave number number. All right? So the lower, the lower this number is, the longer is your wavelength. OK. Same question? OK, I think this is more difficult than I thought. All right, so I just said if we measure the frequencies of the peaks here, then we can get a hold of the spherical average, the 1D structure inside the Earth. Well, it turns out we are dealing with a rotating planet. We are dealing with a slightly oblate pa uh, planet. And we are dealing with 3D structure. All of these three things, they remove the degeneracy of the free oscillations. What that means is when we look at one particular mode, it actually turns out it's not just one single oscillation. Each mode actually um, consists of 2L plus 1 so-called singlets. So uh, 0S2 has five, actually five um, oscillations. OK, so 0S2 is here. So this is basically, in principle, what these five single oscillations would look like. And so if we actually zoom in on a spectrum, a very long spectrum, because if you have a short spectrum, then you have a very limited frequency resolution in a spectrum. If we have a very long time series, and then we calculate a spectrum, then you have a finer resolution in a frequency domain. And then you are actually able to see, so this is now the single frequency peak um, looked uh, up closer, and you see that we are actually not dealing with one frequency line, with one resonance frequency, but with a whole set um, of these oscillations. And measuring these things, then this gives you information on the 3D structure of the Earth. All right? Yes? Uh, yes, also. Right. Though this here is um, actually, in this particular case, this is just at one station. All right. Okay, so and, and to wrap up the free oscillation part here, I want to show two applications. Um, one of them I was involved in. Um, this again shows some of the modes that are actually uh, sensitive to inner core structure. And so, you know, it's just a whole set that we used here. Um, and um, one of the things that we wanted to do is there was in 1996, there was this body wave study that, that had this spectacular, or actually there were two sets of studies that had this spectacular result that the inner core is rotating a little faster than the rest of the planet. And we actually thought, well, you know, if you can do this with body waves, it's actually maybe um, a more robust way um, to look at this problem with free oscillations. Um, and it turns out when we did this, so this is um, when we, we did this study in, in 99, um, and then we, and recently we redid it, it actually turns out that the last 10 years was really ridiculously productive in terms of very large earthquakes um, compared to the decades before. And, and this is an analysis just for one mode where we looked um, what type of rotation rate it would take um, to, um, to make the historical data compatible with the more recent data, okay? And so this here is a fit for all the earthquakes that we, that we had in the last couple decades or so, um, assuming a rotation rate. And for this particular mode, it actually turns out 
you, you need a very small rotation rate to actually reconcile the different spectra that we took um, back 40 years ago or more recently for this particular mode. Yeah? What's the x axis? Yeah. The x axis is time. And this is, un okay, this is days from beginning. <laughs> so this is time. These are different earthquakes over the last, um, this was 78 or something, so since 1978 or something. Um, uh, to more recent. Yeah, I'm sorry, this is a very, I just put this in this morning as an example. So those are not dates, right? These are not dates, it's just uh, the number of days from point zero, and point zero was this earthquake in 1978 as a function of time. On the vertical axis, this is the rotation rate that it takes to, um, to reconcile. Um, Maybe I shouldn't even have put this in. <laughs> uh, this is differential rotation rate, yes. Isn't it just the angular position and then the rate, rate is the slope of the curve of the green line? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Actually, that's what I want to get at. And I should, I should have shown you the result and not the way I get there. Because the way I get there is actually quite cool. It's, forget about this plot. So the, the important one is here where we, where we determined the rates to reconcile all the data that we had for the last 40 years for all the modes. And this is a summary plot where um, this is our old study. This is our more recent study that includes all the data of the last 10 years um, for all the modes that we looked at. And of course, if we think that the inner core is rotating as a rigid body, then the same rotation rate um, would apply to all the modes. So you can then safely determine the average, and the average is now really close to zero. Now, if there's, there's still a small possibility that maybe the rotation rate changed in the last 40 years, you know, because there are some um, indications that maybe the inner core is locked to the mantle, but it might still do some, on a short time scale, some back and forth movement, then of course um, we have to have a closer look at this. There, there are some indications that this might be going on, but overall in the last 40 years the rotation rate is zero. Yes. Yeah, I shouldn't have showed that. <laughs> This was only for one particular mode. Now we are taking all the modes together. And, and maybe in three slides or so, it, it would become more clear what I wanted to do. OK. Yes? Uh, these modes all see the same inner core. Yeah. The points are kind of scattered around. Yes. <sighs> yes. Um, first of all, some modes overlap with other modes, so you might be looking at slight con contamination in the spectral estimates from those other modes. Then some modes actually couple with other modes. I wanted to get back to that. Actually, some modes couple with other modes. If you analyze that mode as an isolated mode and you don't take into account that it's coupling with the other one, your spectral estimates are also a little bit off. And so that, that kind of explains the variation that we still have in these diagrams. The other thing it also turns out, you are a little bit sensitive to mantle structure. So it depend, these estimates depend a little bit, and this is actually shown here. With the, you know, these are results that you get with different 3D mantle models. So it depends a little bit on which mantle model you're using. That's where the scatter comes in. How do you get the rotation rate? Can I defer this until we get to phase velocity maps? All right. Okay, another study um, that shows you know how useful modes are is, and Barbara pointed it out, that is that modes are really sensitive to density, and so here's an application 
where Guy um, analyzed, reanalyzed all the modes to um, ask two questions um, about density jumps or the density near the core mantle boundary. And so he determined, they did some resolution, in-depth resolution analysis, and they found that the density jump at the inner core boundary is actually larger than uh, previously thought. Um, this has implications on how the geo, geodyna, how the inner core grows in, on the geodynamo. And then the other thing is that they didn't find real um, significant evidence that there is um, high density anomalies near the core mantle boundary that are associated with these hot abyssal layers. You might remember that we had these, we have these huge uh, low velocity zones near the core mantle boundary beneath Africa and the Central Pacific. And then there, there was, there are mode studies that suggest that they are not only seismically anomalously slow, but they are also anomalously dense. Now it turns out, on global, uh, on global scale, as a, as a, a global average, there is actually um, no need to increase the density um, in a 1D model. I'm not sure if I get this across really well, but it turns out that there might be some local areas where you have higher density near the core mantle boundary, but it is not something that is a global feature so that you have to change or adjust the 1D model. So it's on a spherical average, you don't really see these, these um, anomalously high density areas if they actually exist, because there's some controversy about that still also. Okay, so this would be the mode part of my talk. <laughs> All right, let's... Yeah, I tried to figure this out, and Guy was a little bit vague about this. So within the current error bars that we, that we have, within the current uncertainties, we can't really tell, especially not in a 1D model, that it's, it's really dense down there. Can a model that has increasing density by 1 or 2 percent? That's right, that's right. Guy's analysis said that it could not be that. It could not be, yes. So... Like in K135, I guess. So, so, but, but, I just get that. So, is, there's no excess density above X percent? One or two. Maybe it's, it's smaller than one. One or two percent is still dynamically interesting. Yeah, but it could, be, it could not be one percent. <laughs> well, it's just, it's, okay, but the quantitative answer here is of great importance. And one percent would still be of importance. Okay, I have to reread the paper then. Right. Yeah, I mean, there must be some radial length too, right? I mean, it must be 100%. 200, yes, okay. Yes, that is true. And, and, oh, geez, can we turn that camera off? <laughs> uh, yes. If that dense layer is really, really thin, like smaller than 50 kilometers or so, then it is still possible that, you, that it is there. Um, in his calculations, I think what I saw is that um, you have to average, or the study averages over 200 kilometers. So on a scale of 200 kilometers, you cannot accommodate 1% density increase. So if there is some density, excess density, it has to be really thin. Yeah. If we're talking about the large flow two wave velocity problems, we're not expecting a large uh, density difference to dynamically support it. Otherwise, it would be flat, right? Well, some other mode studies indicated otherwise. So. It would be a flat layer if it's, if it's a lot <coughs> denser. I mean, people uh -huh. are talking about that. Yes. Well, so it's not the whole. Yes. Right. So I guess the idea was that you have some type of sediment that's, that's precip precipitating out of that big red blob and then it accumulates near the core mantle boundary, I guess, within that red blob. So I guess that's still possible. I mean, this study did, truth be told, this study did not say that you can't have something that is anomalously dense, which is really thin. 
I think that's fair to say. All right? Point four percent. Okay, there so you got it. But but over two hundred kilometers, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can we go to surface waves now? <laughs> okay. So um, you asked earlier how the free oscillations relate to the surface waves. So it actually turns out you need only three wave trains to make standing waves. So what this shows again, these are spectra. So this is a spectrum where we included a lot of, so all the wave trains from R1 through R8, so the ones that go around four times. This here is a spectrum that only has the first wave train. So if, if R1, one surface wave package, of course travels around the way, the globe and does not know anything about the finiteness of the planet. So there is no discrete peaks in a spectrum. If you combine one wave train with the one that repeat that went around, so the repeat wave train, then you actually see all the modes. The only thing is that the amplitude of these modes aren't quite right yet. And if you add the one wave train that goes the other way, so the major arc wave, then you get this nice modulation that you see in the real long spectrum here. So this modulation of the amplitude here, that depends on the epicentral distance. Okay, so it, in print you need only three wave trains to make a standing wave in terms of our free oscillations here. Yes? The y-axis here is spectral amplitude. I said calculate spectra, so Fourier spectrum. And then you get amplitude or energy versus frequency. Just like the lines of hydrogens, the hydrogen lines. But I guess I would have seen the second panel down uh, in the opposite color direction, the energy decreasing. As function of frequency? You have more energy in a higher frequencies than in a lower frequency. That depends on our earthquake, where the earthquake is. And you know, it's easier to excite those higher frequency, shallower waves than those deeper looking waves. This is just fundamental modes now. So I'm trying to make standing waves out of traveling waves. And so what this should show is to get all the free to get all the fundamental modes you need to have R1 so the one wave train and then the repeating one and so the two together make you realize make the Rayleigh waves realize whoops I'm dealing with a finite body but to get the actual amplitude mod modulation that we have, you know, in a real spectrum, you actually need the wave that goes the other way around. So the major arc wave, the opposite. Maybe I shouldn't have done this. <laughs> so for now, we are leaving the standing waves and go to traveling waves. Now, there's a little bit of a complication. When we uh, make Free, when we um, describe free oscillations, we use spherical harmonics, okay, so the PLMs. Now it turns out if we, um, for relatively short distances, okay, I got, I got to back up here. The free oscillations we describe with spherical harmonics and the, and the traveling waves we describe with cosines and sines. And it turns out if you stay away from the poles of the spherical harmonics, then the cosines actually um, describe really nicely the corresponding um, spherical harmonics. But there's a problem when you go towards the poles. So here you have a spherical harmonic, and then a corresponding cosine is this dashed line here. And you see very nicely, it, it fits very well away from the poles, but then when you get close to the poles, so once the Rayleigh wave goes to the antipode, 
then you get more and more of a phase shift or a problem to match your spherical harmonic by this cosine. And it actually turns out every time you pass a pole, there is actually a phase shift of 2 pi over 2. All right? And so then you have to actually add, it's, it's called the pi over 2 polar phase shift. And so for the traveling waves, we have to take that into account and then correct the phase for this. All right? Okay, now phase velocity and group velocity. We, we have um, dispersion going on here, and um, so the travel speed is dependent on frequency, and in case you have dispersion, you actually have two different velocities. It's a phase and a group velocity. Both of these you can get by uh, considering that the largest contribution to a seismogram or to, to a displacement you get when the phase is stationary. All right? So when the derivative with respect to omega to the frequency is zero. And so at the end then, um, you get the group velocity, which is simply um, the omega by dk. dk is the wave number here, and omega is the frequency. So this gives you the group velocity. The group velocity is the velocity with which um, the energy is transported, all right? And then we have this other velocity, which is the phase velocity, and it is simply omega over k, all right? And that's the velocity with which a phase travels. And those two velocities are typically not the same. So if we go back to our, okay, so here, a little bit of a concept, so, as a func so this is a seismogram or the wave um, traveling as a function of distance here, and so dispersion simply means the longer you travel, the more your wave train gets dispersed and pulled apart, and depending on the velocity structure, you know, one type of wave, one wavelength stays behind and one wavelength speeds up. Typically, or in a period range that we are looking at, the long wavelengths typically travel faster than the shorter wavelengths, so the shorter wavelengths stay behind. And here's, again, the concept between group velocity and phase velocity is where when you look at group velocity, you look at the envelope, and so you look at the whole wave packet, basically, um, around a certain, it's almost monochromatic, but not quite, so you look at the, a, um, a wave packet of frequencies, but very narrow. And so the group velocity tells you how this whole wave packet, the amplitude of that wave packet travels. That would be that U here. But if you look at the phase velocity, then you look at this individual wiggle here, and the phase velocity travel, uh, tells you how fast that individual wiggle travels. All right? OK. Um, so this is again that omega k plot or the wave number omega plot that I showed you earlier with a different um, mode branches. And so again, um, the frequency, so omega in principle over k, this angular order is basically k, so that gives you the phase velocity. And d omega by dk gives you the group velocity, so this is the, the slope of uh, this is slightly curved here, so that's why group velocity changes with a frequency. So that slope gives you the group velocity. Typically, we distinguish between anomalous and normal dispersion. Typically, uh, the phase velocity is greater than a group velocity. Then we talk about normal dispersion. In some very few incidences where we have very low frequency at fundamental mode, fundamental modes now, the group velocity is actually larger than a phase velocity, but it's really only a few, few modes. So typically we have normal dispersion, so phase velocity greater than group velocity. Okay, so there was this question how we did the inner core stuff. All right, so 3D structure makes the local phase velocity or in terms of standing waves, the local frequencies different. So, so you have, you know, since the shear velocity varies with, um, in, with latitude and longitude, 
So does the phase velocity change and also the mode frequencies as the station, as the seismogram sees it. And there's actually a close relationship from the standing wave point of view and from the traveling point of view. And so it actually turns out you can make the 3D structure in terms of frequency, mode frequency, visible in a so-called splitting function. So what this shows you is now frequency anomalies as a function of geography. So you have, you know, relatively low frequency, anomalously low frequencies here and anomalously high frequencies here. And you can compare this with results that you get from traveling waves where we say, okay, we have now local phase velocities um, as a function of geography, um, relatively high velocities and here and low velocities along the mid-ocean ridges or so on. This is very large scale structure. I should also say this is only even structure. So it's the symmetric, symmetric structure. We ignore the odd harmonic degrees. Yes? Which depth? Well, okay, to answer that question, we would have to go back and look what the sensitivity kernel of Sirius 52 looks like. Okay, so typically six millihertz, that's the upper 400 kilometers at most. All right, but again, this is only the symmetric part. The odd harmonic degrees have been removed here because modes only see, isolated modes are only sensitive to symmetric structure. So for our inner core stuff that we did is we actually looked at these splitting functions here. And then we removed the contributions from the mantle because we know the mantle very well. And then we tried to rotate what's left should be the inner core then, all right? Because we assume that the outer core doesn't have a structure. Then we rotated it and then we added that inner core part back to the mantle and then we have a new splitting function and we did this for each of the earthquakes. And then we saw what type of rotation rate we needed to make that match best for these earthquakes. And that's how we got the rotation rates. Um, yeah, you know, there's, there's many groups that have mantle models. There's, you know, the Scripps group, the Grant model, shear velocity model, the Berkeley group has a mantle model. And so we predict splitting functions that only come from the mantle, the contribution only with a mantle, and then we subtract the mantle and see what's left, and then we start rotating and trying to fine tune um, the frequencies of those inner core modes. And the surface topography? Hmm? The surface topography? Yes, that matters. It turns out that matters. That, this is included in a mantle model. So the mantle model includes topography, crustal structure, you know, oceans are thinner than, than a continents. All this is included in our mantle model. Yeah. Okay. Can I leave my talk just for a second? Well, can I finish my sentence? Ex excuse me. Sorry. Sorry. So you have these elongated uh, features which are very typical of the mantle, whereas in the core, you have features that are completely aligned in the opposite direction, so it's fast in the fall, fall region and slow in the equatorial region. So if you remove the mantle, you should be picking up on a typical um, uh, signature of the Can I leave that talk just for a sec? I have a picture that shows it better. Actually, I don't have it with me. All right, let's continue. Yeah. So what kind of structure do you use in the new core and what is the structure which is more pronounced than what you use? 
can I just get my disk real fast? Yes, yeah, really long wavelengths, but that's all we are really interested in because if the core is rotating, the long wavelength, you know, is rotating just with the same speed, really. Okay, so Okay, so so what we did is so what we observe is this here. So we, these are two modes that are sensitive to mantle, outer core and inner core. And so what we observe at the surface is this is 13S2 mode 13S2 and mode 15S3, two examples. What we observe is, is that, um, you know, large scale structure, this mode is only sensitive to structure up to degree four and does not see shorter wavelength structure. And this is sensitive to degree six. So it's always sensitive to 2L. They don't see the shorter wavelength structure. And so you see in both cases, you know, we have this really um, pronounced ring of um, high, um, frequency, so positive frequency anomalies. Well, and then as Barbara said, since these modes are sensitive to mantle, outer core and inner core, if we want to get at the inner core, we need to correct now these splitting functions for the signal from the mantle. So from body wave tomography, we know what the mantle looks like. We can predict that signal from the mantle, which is these two things here for the two modes, and then we subtract this from this, and this from this, and then we are left with the signal that is only due to the outer core and the inner core, which is this here, all right? And it's, it's very often typical for inner core sensitive modes that you have the, this, this um, so, um, almost or dominantly sonal pattern where you have high, high frequency or high velocity poles and then um, a relatively low velocity equatorial thing. But the fact that they have lobes and it's not completely, so, so not completely sonal allows you to rotate and, and figure out what type of rotation rate do I need to, ex to um, explain this pattern here. If the modes were completely sonal, then we could not do this. Yes? What's the depth resolution of these modes? And what kind of features do you see? The depth resolution? Well, this is the, the uh, that's what the eigenfunctions tell you. They tell you the sensitivity to the structure in the inner core and, and what to expect. And typically, you know, over a depth range of 200, 200 kilometers or so. I mean, you know, there's some vertical smearing for each of these. Yeah? But then your raw data are the amplitude of the beginning, right? Hmm? It's the raw data, the data that you can use at the beginning. The frequency and the amplitude of the right? In principle, for each, at each station, yes. Uh, we are actually, we only look at the frequency, not the amplitudes. But we have the frequencies at each of the stations, not only one station. And the frequency at all the stations then give, you, give us these patterns. And I would point out also that the 
mental models as obtained by models of surface waves and uh, body weight models are very well constrained at this wavelength. This wavelength, say, say in degree 4, degree 4 means you divide 20,000 kilometers divided by 4, which is 5,000 kilometers. That's the wavelength scale. The kind of length like scale. At this length scale, the thermogenic models are in between the two. Yes, Matt. What these lobes are? Yeah. Structure. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. W one one of the things is so we assume that the that the inner core is is anisotropic and highly anisotropic, and that the that the um, the symmetry axis is actually tilted relative to the rotation axis, so this could be, this could be causing this asymmetry in the lobes, the tilt of that anisotropy axis. The modes don't really they don't really at this point they don't really tell you if it's just isotropic structure that I'm looking at here, or if it's the tilt in the anisotropy axis. That we don't really, from this, we don't really know. We would have to do some inversions. But for the inner core, to get the inner core rotation rate, we didn't really care. All that matters is that you have something that varies um, as a function of longitude. And as long as you have something that varies as a function of longitude, you can do this hypothesis test. What type of rotation rate do I need? Uh, well, these are the raw data. In principle, you should get the same pattern, considering that the different modes are sensitive. So, you know, this mode here is sensitive to structure all the way to degree 10. But in principle, you know, they sort of look similar, I would say, considering. Because then the, the other thing is, you also have to consider that, that these modes, they are sensitive to different depths within the inner core. So if you have a layered inner core with different structures, then this, this would change the splitting function also. So that the fact that they are not totally similar tells you, okay, we have radial structure within the inner core. Yes, right. Even degree, because we do, um, well, actually, we do include some coupling, but typically isolated modes, yeah. Setting S2 is coupled to some other modes, so we have to take that into account. Yes? Related to that question, yeah. related to your answer, <laughs> I, I was reflecting on the innermost inner core. We can't see that. Oh. That's a body wave. This, this is something you have to do with body waves. Okay. Right? Be because the eigenfunctions, they, go, they, go, they are really, really small. And my personal opinion is you can't really do that with modes. But other people might think differently. Yeah? These four observations, so it really looks like the poles are different than the middle of the equatorial part, right? In good yeah. years, artifacts of symmetry of the waves or the way the symmetry will work with both waves. Artifact? I mean, yeah, 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 because look at the, the pictures here, right? Well, that's, that's a very uh, kind of remarkable. No, no. I don't think so. We are not sensitive to degree one. So if we have a hemispherical thing, we, we don't see that.
Okay, so I have about five more minutes or so. I think I have to. Okay, let's, let's get back to the surface then. The very, very upper surface. Uh, now actually I want to, this is kind of important too. Okay, so if we concentrate on the, on a, on a, on the upper, on the upper mantle, um, how are the surface waves sensitive to structure at depth? Barbara already pointed out it's not only VP and VS, but it's also density. So these are sensitivity kernels. So essentially, again, the, the compressional and shear energy density, um, those integral kernels um, for phase velocity now, uh, for Rayleigh waves on this side and for love waves um, on this side, uh, for different mode branches. So we have the zero S or the Rayleigh waves here on the top for density um, and VP and VS and then also the love waves here. Of course, um, you know, from the beginning of the talk it should be obvious that love waves are only sensitive to shear velocity but not to VP, not compressional velocity, but there's also some um, small small but sensitivity to density as well, you know, in the upper 100 kilometers or so. Um, different colors here signify different frequencies. So the darker ones are lower frequencies. They actually, I should blow this up, but they are actually sensitive to deeper structure here. And then the higher frequencies, they concentrate more and more the sensitivity to shallower depths here uh, for Rayleigh waves and for love waves here. If you look at the first two overtone branches, so the first overtone already for Rayleigh waves but also for love waves, you increase the sensitivity to structure at depth significantly. So that's why seismologists, even though this is uh, more difficult, it would be really nice to also analyze the overtones because that gives you then um, enhanced resolution in a transition zone here with fundamental modes alone, this is very difficult to do. Um, also, Rayleigh waves are sensitive to VP, also compressional wave, but you see that the sensitivity is actually restricted to very shallow depths. So with Rayleigh waves, um, you cannot, or with, with the fundamental modes, you cannot really look at VP at greater depths. Um, second overtone branch, you increase, um, successively you increase your sensitivity for a structure at greater depths. Um, so this is isotropic. There is also um, transverse isotropy that came uh, from an observational point of view that first came into play when uh, people analyzed the dispersion of Rayleigh waves and also dispersion of love waves and then they tried to combine these data to find um, a 1D model that explains both Rayleigh and love waves and it turned out it was really, really difficult to do this. You get highly oscillating models, so an, an interlayer model with unrealistically high velocities, then unrealistically low velocities and then high velocities again. And so that's indication that maybe we are looking at um, anisotropy in, in shear um, wave speed or also in P wave speed. So here are the sensitivities again for Rayleigh waves and for love waves for these different parameters. Again, love waves are not sensitive to VP in both directions, vertical and horizontal, um, but they are sensitive um, primarily to SH, so the horizontal shear velocity. This is not surprising. But maybe the, 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 the surprising part is they are sensitive to a little bit, so they are a little bit sensitive to vertical shear velocity as well. And people usually ignore this, but here it is. 
small sensitivity. Rayleigh waves are sensitive to both vertical and horizontal p velocity. Um, they are not sensitive to the still not sensitive to the horizontal shear velocity, only the vertical shear velocity. All right, so this is a little bit surprising here. Um, there's also, this is an example, we are not only dealing with the, the vertical anisotropy, so the vertical difference between SH, VSH and VSV. There's also in azimuthal, if you have mantle flow in horizontal direction or so, you also get azimuthal anisotropy um, that you can analyze through shear wave splitting, where you know the shear waves, um, you decompose them into a vertical and a horizontal shear wave, and then you get the, um, uh, the delay in the fast direction that way. You can also do that with Rayleigh waves, and they are typically expanded in a trigonometric um, power series here, and then it's truncated, and in realistic mineralogies, it actually turns out, uh, luckily, that Rayleigh waves are only sensitive to um, these three terms, so the azimuthal average term, which is essentially the transverse isotropy, and then these cosine and sine two psi terms. Psi is the direction in which you are looking at. And so this is just um, an image on a regional study of the fast direction, so the two, two psi terms here um, around Hawaii, an experiment that I did um, as a function of frequency here. So you see, remember the higher frequencies, they are more sensitive to shallower stuff, and the lower frequencies, 10 millihertz here, they see into the asthenosphere, and you see essentially here that um, fast directions align nicely with the fossil spreading direction, so things that are frozen into the lithosphere, and if you go um, to deeper depths into the asthenosphere, then things are, are a little bit messed up here. All right, that's azimuthal anisotropy. I was actually hoping to go a little bit, let's see, we have to cut this out a bit. Okay, um, leading a little bit into the tutorial then. Um, let's see, I think I want to finish with this. So, it actually turns out, but we are not going to do this in a tutorial. Just measuring, it's actually amazingly difficult to measure the dispersion in a seismogram really, really accurately. The problem is that the wave trains are relatively short. They are only 15 minutes or so. And remember when I said that the longer the time series is, the better frequency resolution you have. And so if you have only 15 minutes, that actually gives you a very crude resolution in a frequency domain. And it actually turns out that if you have, on a global scale, if you have an earthquake and then a station a couple thousand kilometers away or so, both the group travel time and the phase, they change insanely quickly with frequency. So just taking a spectrum and then trying to measure the phase, that is not giving you the right tool to measure the phase. So what you actually have to do is um, you have to minimize the travel path as best as possible so that the phase and the group travel time doesn't change as much with frequency anymore. And so the best way to do this is that you measure, in a global study for example, that you measure your phase against a synthetic seismogram and you basically do a transfer function, you apply a transfer function technique or something like this. So in principle, by doing this, by comparing it with a synthetic seismogram, you basically remove the strong distance dependent change in phase that we are not really interested in anyway. All right, so that, that makes our very long story short. So we always measure differential phase and in principle also differential group travel times. Yes? You had a question? No? Okay. And so then you have this whole set. So we, you have lots of earthquakes, you have lots of stations, and then lots of group travel time data and phase travel time or phase data. And then in an inversion that we'll try to do tomorrow, and actually Barbara 
talks in more detail on Saturday, then we do inversions for these local uh, phase velocities or group velocities as a function of frequency. And then in a second set on, of inversions, we take all these phase velocity maps now as a function of frequency and combine them and then make a 3D model. All right? So here we see um, a set of phase velocity maps at two different frequencies. Um, this is the Africa hemisphere and a Pacific hemisphere, basically, um, and the same here. And group velocities at the same frequencies. Now, we have to bear in mind that typically um, phase velocities at the same frequency are actually uh, sensitive to deeper structure than a group velocity. So if you are interested in crustal um, structure only, then it's better to look at group velocities than to look at phase velocities. If you want to um, examine deeper structure, then phase, a lot, phase velocity maps would be better. Essentially, they should be overall the same because they, they see the same Earth. You know, if you, if, you, if you compare different frequencies, slightly different frequencies, what you typically see um, also in, the, in other tomographic images that mid-ocean ridges, they have low seismic velocities and then low stable cratons, and this is better seen in a longer period uh, phase velocity waves, uh, the, the lower frequencies phase velocity maps, the stable cratons, they typically have higher, um, higher velocities. All right, and so um, what we typically do is we do smooth inversions, but I'll talk about this later today or tomorrow, where there are certain parameters and uncertainties that you play with. And then the small, smalls in small scale, these maps can look a little bit different. It also depends on a earthquake a geometry a little bit and also on a theory that you're using, you know, some people or the simplest way to um, interpret or make these maps is using ray theory. So you assume just that the, tr that the waves travel from the receiver, uh, from, the from the earthquake to a station along the shortest path and then you just integrate over the, um, the travel time over this path and it turns out the, pr the problem here in Earth in surface wave um, seismology is that the structures that you are after, they are getting to the same wavelengths. So the, these waves are relatively long wavelengths. And so the structures that you are after, um, they are about the same, get about the same wavelength as the signal that you are using to look at these structures. And then you get diffraction effects or scattering effects. And so then the simple ray theory is not necessarily valid anymore. And you have, you have to use more complicated theories like the finite frequency theory that takes into account this, these effects from diffraction or scattering. But in principle, so, um, the results will you know, change in detail a little bit, especially the smaller scale structures, but overall the big picture, the big long wavelengths uh, features, they should stay the same. Even the locations of the smaller things, they should remain because if you, if you use finite frequency theory, then you have a better hold at the, the actual amplitudes of your, or the magnitude of your um, anomalies, but the location of the anomalies shouldn't really change that much but more in a tutorial then. All right, I hope I didn't confuse you too much.